I am Andy Peron. I am an intern math teacher at Byron High School, and I'm going to discuss a big picture overview of the many ways that you can learn and teach through games. So I'm going to start out with a couple examples from a statistics class that I'm teaching this year. And the first one is analyzing a goofy game. That is, minute to win it games. We're going to take a look at how you can do serious analysis on something that's very silly. Next thing we're going to look at is predicting the outcomes of a sport through a simulator. And we're going to look at the game of Ultimate Frisbee. Next, we're going to talk about actually playing a simulation, so almost like a computer game where you are trying to optimize a system, where you're trying to get the best result in the simulator. After that, we're going to look at role-playing games, and this one I'm going to draw from something I never taught with, but actually something that I was a student in and found particularly engaging in social studies class. Second to last, we're going to look at what happens when we have kids design their own games. And this is a case study of a video game that kids design. And then we're going to end with thinking about what are the things that make games engaging? What are the things that make games an effective tool for learning? And how can we then think about our courses as teachers in a new way such that we can design our course to be more like a game? So let's start out with uh, the Minute to Win It games. Here we have one student with a stack of Oreos on his forehead looking a little bit ridiculous. While we have another uh, taking detailed notes of a bunch of data, and another one with a timer in her hand trying to keep track of how long it takes him to complete this challenge. You'll see an open laptop on the table here. That's where they have a Google Doc full of numbers as they complete each round, they go ahead and fill in all the data so they can later use it for analysis. So the games that they're playing are taken from the TV show Minute to Win. And on this show, people have one minute to complete some sort of challenge. Now in this case, uh, Kelvin here is trying to get a certain number of Oreo cookies stacked on his forehead without them falling over in one minute. Each group so I put the kids into groups of three to four. I let them choose their own groups for this particular project. And each group had to pick the game that they wanted to play. Once they had a game, they had to ask a question. So in this group's case, they were looking at whether people are faster with their left hand or faster with their right hand. And so they'd measure times with both. Other groups uh, compared uh, two different objects that they had to compete with or first attempt versus second attempt to see if that made a difference, if they could learn the game and get better, things like that. So they every group picked something that they wanted to study and then made a prediction with that. After that we had our game day. We had all the kids rotate into each other's games, play the games, and see how well they did. They basically were competing in the game. And the team that was doing the study would tell them some kind of goal they had to meet. And those were two of the craziest days of the year. It, it was very chaotic, but probably the most fun I've ever had in a classroom as a teacher. So, And I know the kids enjoyed it too. So the, the game days were very fun, and we were generating hundreds and hundreds of data points per minute. It was great. Finally, we went to the lab and we looked at our Google Docs and we were saying, how do we answer this question? How do we actually use the statistics that we've been learning in class in order to answer the question that you came up with before? And so that's where we use our confidence intervals, our hypothesis tests, things like that, in order to actually make conclusions on this. And then for this particular project, what I had the kids do was write a technical paper that summarized all their findings, both from playing the game and then doing the statistical analysis. So moving on, another stats project. Uh, this one centered around Ultimate Frisbee. So the way that it worked is we went down to the gym and we played Ultimate Frisbee for a day. We just, they, some of them knew how to play, some of them were not exactly sure 
uh, of all the rules. So we did our best to explain it, and then you kind of learn by doing. Once they started to get some intuition, we'd call everyone back in and have a little bit of a group discussion, talk about what are the things that are going well, what, what's making your team play well, and how can we measure that? And we talked about this process of what are, what are things that we can analyze? What are the statistics in the game of Ultimate Frisbee? And I intentionally picked Ultimate Frisbee because it's a sport that hasn't really had any serious analysis done to it because it's not a uh, particularly competitive sport on the global scale, unlike a basketball or a baseball where there's books and websites and fan clubs centered around the statistics of those sports. So we had those discussions, we talked about things like short catches and long catches, talked about uh, your throwing percentage, so how good at, are you at making successful throws, talked about uh, the players themselves, if they're tall, if they're short, if they're fast, if they're slow, things like that. Then what I did is I had a simulator and I gave them thousands of data points, thousands of pieces of information that they had to decide where, what makes a player good. And so this spreadsheet here is just a quick example of a bunch of data that the students asked me to provide them. And these are all made up players here, so these aren't actual people, but a computer simulator just generated all of this data. And it's not perfectly realistic, but it's close enough that you can do, you can do the analysis on it and make pretty good predictions if you do it well. So going back to that spreadsheet here, in each person, each team in the class, we had teams of uh, two to three on this project, each team had to rank their players. They had to come up with some sort of formula that would be the best way of ranking these players from best to worst, most desirable to have on their team. And so each team came up with some sort of formula that they defended and were able to write about and say why they chose that formula but they used the formula to put the players in order. Finally, we had a draft day. For anyone who's done fantasy football before or just seen a draft for a sport, for example, you go around the room, and when your team is up to make a pick, you get to choose from any of the players that are still available. So the kids would look at their spreadsheet, and they would see who wasn't taken, and the best player that wasn't taken, they would draft onto their team. And we'd go around until each team had a full seven players for Ultimate Frisbee. I took those seven players that each team drafted after the draft was complete and put them back into the simulator to see how that team of seven would compete against everyone else's team of seven. And the results were very interesting. We had, because of randomness, it wasn't always the same winner every time. But if you played enough games, the same teams consistently seemed to win. So there were some teams that seemed to have the best strategy. And after talking with those teams and looking at their approach, I can see why they, they did well. It, their logic for why they picked their teams the way they did made a lot of sense. And some of the teams that struggled and the same thing, we had a lot of discussion there. We looked at some of the graphs they came up with, some of the statistical analysis from their projects, and were able to talk about all of the things that they could have done. They, a lot of kids had great analysis, but then didn't necessarily apply it to their formula particularly well. Here is the, a quick screenshot of the simulator. It was nothing real fancy, but just something to give some sort of output to the kids to say, okay, who did the best in, the, in a long regular season, and then we finished up with a tournament just to make things a little bit more random and give give a one game upset a little bit higher chance of that. Moving on, this is a project I did with sixth graders in a science class out in Boston. There are, uh, the goal of this game is to harvest fish to make as much money as possible. So if you harvest these animals, if you harvest the fish, you get paid. However, if you're harvesting too many fish per round, you're eventually going to crash your ecosystem. All the fish are going to die out, and then all the penguins that eat the fish are going to die out, and so forth. And so 
On the other side of things, if you don't manage your wildlife and you just try to let the fish population grow infinitely, you're going to end up wiping out all the plankton and crashing your ecosystem in that way. And so the idea of this game is to teach kids about uh, managing a balanced ecosystem. And they'll play it a few times, and they're almost guaranteed the first couple times they play to do it wrong. They're going to make mistakes, and they're going to crash their ecosystem and not make very much money. But as they start to get the hang of it, perhaps talking to a neighbor, they get some ideas, or just figuring it out from a few trials, they start to understand the importance of balance. You can then go back in a discussion with the kids, so after letting them play for a half hour, you can go back and have the discussion about a balanced ecosystem and wildlife management, and the kids are much more receptive, much more able to actually understand what you're talking about, and even contribute to the discussion to say why it makes sense to even not just for the environment, but economic sense, to have a balanced environment. So the goal was to make the most money over a 100 year period and within the game, and you had to harvest enough to be profitable without destroying the ecosystem. And then finally, like I mentioned, uh, that the most powerful part of this project is not necessarily just playing the game, but the discussion that you have as a group afterwards. Moving on to the role-playing games, this is taking a look at a contest, a debate contest between the presidents of the United States, the historical presidents. And in the social studies class that I took, it was an American history class, we each were put into teams of two, and our teams of two were given approximately uh, one, two presidents. And so we each represented these presidents in a debate, and we would debate against each other. And just like in any sort of basketball tournament, for example, you had a head-to-head -head matchup, and if you won, you moved on. The winner was determined by the other students in the class. There was We divided up the class into a few different rooms so that we could have more debates going on at once, and if you win, you move on, and then you keep going up the bracket, playing harder and harder presidents, better and better presidents. And the idea is that the best president will end up being the champion of this tournament. But it's determined by peer vote and by student debate. So it's up to the students who are doing this project to come up with the best ideas, the best uh, arguments for why their uh, represented president is very good. And so people like Abe Lincoln were not necessarily guaranteed victory, although they had a huge advantage over some of the weaker presidents in our history. This particular project for me was incredibly engaging. I was really into the basketball tournaments, uh, March Madness, and as a student I really enjoyed getting up, taking on that role-playing and trying to win, to be competitive. So it was, there's a lot of particular things in that scenario that engaged me, and also the teamwork part of it, that made this a very effective project. Next one is looking at kids that are designing their own games. This project here was on Roanoke Island. This was a social studies class with Byron students. It was a team of three freshman social studies students. First, they researched the history of the island. This was just part of a class project. They were learning about Roanoke Island. But then, the way that they went forward from there was having to actually create something of their own. And so in order to create something, they had to design a setting. Where, If we're going to make a game, where is this game taking place? Well, in the case of Roanoke, the island is a, is a pretty straightforward setting there. But what does the island look like? What's on the island? Who's on the island? And that gets into the characters. Who are you representing? So if you're the main character walking around the island, are you one of the people who visited? Are you one of the natives? And you need to make decisions like that to see whether your game will be engaging or not. And then finally, the storyline or the goal or plot of the game needs to be designed. 
We made the game in Game Maker, and when I say we, I mean that very loosely because I personally provided a small amount of technical direction and then got out of the way. The kids were great in doing a lot of their own research. All it really took was a little bit of support in some of the tough areas. So there's certain things that are just not particularly intuitive when you get into programming type things. And even though most of this is set up as a visual environment, you don't really necessarily have to look at code, the kids tend to want to make their games more interactive, to do certain things, behave certain ways, like the more polished games that they're used to playing. And so it's really engaging for the kids to try to get into some of the higher level uh, development of the game itself, not just the storyline. So one thing to take away from that, though, is if the focus is not on the technical development of the game, it might be better to design a board game on paper or to come up with a role playing game or some sort of other game that doesn't require the time investment of the technology piece but does allow still for the full design process to come to fruition. Last thing I want to talk about is some exciting things about games, some engaging learning elements about games that can make it an effective way to think about designing your course. Starting out with goals. Now goals are very familiar to teachers and this is nothing new. We're used to creating essential learner outcomes or uh, we have to align to our state standards. We need to make sure that um, for AP classes we're looking at the AP standards. Uh, there's many different uh, national, international, uh, local or curriculum specific goals that we're doing and sometimes we just have our own goals. But when the kids feel like they have a very clear sense of what they need to be doing and there's feedback for obtaining those goals, positive reinforcement for obtaining those goals, they tend to be more motivated. In a game, the for many games, a lot of them that are competition based or multiplayer, the goal is to defeat the other team. Or if you think of games such as SimCity where you're simulating a city, you're trying to build a, a city, the goal is to stay financially sustainable. If you end up losing uh, too much money then you're not able to build anything new and the game no longer is fun. And so you're trying to be sustainable and grow your population, things like that. So depending on what type of game you're playing, the goal can be different. Uh, Angry Birds is a great example for a very simple goal. The goal is to knock everything over, to kill all the angry, uh, all the, uh, the pigs. You need to use your birds to kill all the pigs pretty straightforward and that's why such a simple game can be so addicting. You know exactly what you have to do, you just need to find a way to do it. Moving on, another part about games is once you have a clear goal, you have the freedom to explore how to accomplish that goal in many different ways. And some of those are going to be unsuccessful paths, but the game doesn't stop you from doing something that's not very effective. For example, uh, first-person shooter games, a lot of times you're most effective uh, staying with a group or hiding behind objects such that you're not in the open so that you would get killed by an opponent. However, if you choose to run out into the middle of the arena, unprotected all by yourself, the game's not going to say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't run out there, you might get hurt. They just let you die. And the next time you play, you're like, oh, well, that didn't, that didn't work very well, so I'll have to try something new. And if that doesn't work, eventually you start to figure out, okay, well, this seems to be a good strategy, this seems to be a good strategy. Games give you the freedom to explore and try and fail, but your failures are often very small, and you're back up on your feet within a few seconds. You're respawning alive again, such that even though you died in the game, no harm was done. A big piece of that uh, on the side, the psychological side is the sense of control that a player has when they're in a game. They feel like they control their environment, they control their fate. It's not determined for them. So they have the freedom to do what they want and the freedom to learn however they want and they have this sense of control. And then finally, 
you need to balance those two pieces we talked about earlier by putting kids in the proper flow state. What this means is that you're trying to balance your skill level and the difficulty of the task. And one of the best ways that games do this is through levels. When you start a new game, you start out at level one. And in level one, it's really hard to make a lot of major mistakes. And the game isn't all that difficult. Now, if you were very advanced and you picked up the game at level one, it wouldn't be very fun because you'd be bored. It'd be too easy. And in the same way, if you were a new player and you picked up the game at level 50, the challenges are so hard that you would lose every time and you would not find the game interesting at all. You'd get anxious or just want to quit. So games do a good job of if you accomplish some small tasks, they give you a little bit harder tasks, a little bit bigger tasks. You complete the level one, knocking over some things in Angry Birds. They give you a little bit bigger structure to knock over and maybe a few more uh, birds that you can use. So this idea of slowly letting you do more things as you gain more skills keeps the game engaging, keeps a constant challenge that's not too hard that it's anxious, that you're anxious, but not too easy that you're bored either. And along with this is the idea of doable challenge. On the psychological side, you want to make sure that the challenges that you give students feel like there's something they can accomplish. Going back to one of the uh, statistics games I talked about earlier, one of the troubles with that uh, project early on was I didn't provide a whole lot of structure. I gave kids these giant spreadsheets full of numbers, and they weren't really sure what to do about it. Well, how, do they, how do they use that to help them? They've never seen a spreadsheet with that many numbers and been told they have to create a team out of that. So being able to structure some mini projects, some examples, just to get them started such that then they can see, oh, well, if I put this piece here, put that piece there, I can accomplish the goal of having the best team. It was a, it was a very helpful thing to scaffold that experience. So again, just quick recap on that. Creating clear objectives is really important because it gives students direction of what they need to do. Then giving them the freedom to explore and differentiate how they learn gives them a chance to learn however they want as long as they're still heading towards that objective that you set. One of the effective things about games is rapid feedback. When they do something, they instantaneously know if it worked or not because they either got points, they moved up a level, or they died. Whereas in school, a lot of times, the feedback cycle is very long. It might be a week before they get assessed on something they just learned, and then maybe a couple more days before they get any information back, and might not have a chance to redo it anyway, such that the feedback isn't useful. It's just, oh, you did well, or oh, you failed. Along tied into that is the freedom to, ex to fail small in a game. When you make a failure, it's not catastrophic, whereas in school sometimes failures, uh, failing a test for example, can be truly catastrophic and maybe even lead to failing an entire course. And then the last step, points reflecting progress. In a game, as you do things that are positive and helpful to you, you're earning points constantly. You're, you're always getting that feedback from the game that you're doing good things and making sure that as educators, how can we provide an environment that constantly gives students positive reinforcement for making progress? So I talked about st some statistics projects looking at how you take a, uh, a silly activity and provide serious analysis around it, how you take a sport and make predictions based on it, how you can try to optimize a system such as an ecosystem, through a game, the idea of role-playing games, taking on a character and debating, kids creating their own games, in particular uh, computer games, and then finally looking at the attributes of games to think about how you'd redesign your course. Thank you for listening, and I hope that was helpful.